Uh, the man next to me needs no introduction. He's the reason why many of us are here together today. And we're here to celebrate, in a way, our community that you have helped us brought together. So Massimo Di Piero is going to talk about eight years of Web 2 Pi. Massimo? Hello, everybody. So can you hear me? Thanks for being here. Uh, <clears throat> OK, so uh, I will give uh, a brief introduction to Web 2 Pi with some examples and try to give you a historical perspective how things happened. So the Wet Pi project started in 2007, and it started when, uh, after a project we did for the United Nations, we used Django as content management system to build uh, um, a content management system for the United Nations. And uh, I also was using it for teaching a class, and I found that it was too hard for the students, so I wanted something different. And that's how we started the Wet Pi project. At the time, it was not called Web2Pi, it was called Gluon, but somebody called me and said, uh, uh, I have the copyright on the word, and I'm going to sue you. And I said, I'm a physicist. If anybody has a copyright on this word, it should be me. And he said, can you afford it? And I said, OK, no, I'll change the name. So I had 24 hours to change the name. I didn't know how to call it. I really like the Web.Py framework. So it was created by Aaron Schwartz. So I call him and I say, can I call my framework Web2Pi? Web because I want to honor yours. and he said, of course, you can do that. So that's how it became Web2Pi. And uh, so it changed uh, a little bit since then. And I'm going to go over what changed and what didn't change. But we had a lot of successes. So in the 2011, we won the BOSI Award. In 2012, we won the Technology of the Year Award. We had two books. And we have a very large community of registered users. But even more people uh, use Web2Pi who are not registered. You don't have to be registered to use it. So. To me, the most important thing of web 2 pi is not the code today. It's this. It's the community we've built. And this is a very old uh, slide. Actually, a lot of people were not in this slide. Because through web 2 pi I got to meet a lot of really interesting people. Some of my best friends today are people like web 2 pi contributors who I met online. And some of them I never met in person. Some of them I have met in person. Uh, I found that with other uh, contributors, we share interests, we share passions, we share a uh, vision about what's important, what's not important. And uh, they taught me way more than I taught them. I mean, contributors of Web2Pi have taught me how to use a version control system. Actually, they've not really taught me. They tried to, taught me, to teach me, and they still try to teach me, and I still don't know how to use Git. Uh, but but they, they, they're really good, and they insist and help me to do that. And uh, um, so if Web2Pi were to disappear, I think we have a community we would build something better today than Web2Pi. So when it started, we had some priorities. Uh, we wanted to make something was easy to use. We uh, want security to be, to be the most important thing, so leave no security choices to developers. We wanted batteries included. We wanted convention of a configuration. And we wanted to make it always backward compatible. So at the time, other frameworks were very popular. One of them was Django. And uh, the problem with it, at the time there were some problems, was really hard. Uh, to use for students, for example. And for me, that, that was a priority. That's why it's easy to use. Uh, and still today, to use it, you really need to use command line. Um, you, use, you need to use the shell. And uh, believe it or not, a lot of students get into a master's degree in computer science, and they don't know how to use the shell. They don't know, wh what do I type here? Okay, So uh, I wanted to remove every uh, need for interaction with a shell and every need for doing maintenance. Uh, also, security uh, is a concern. For example, when we started with 2Pi, Django by default was not doing cross-site request forgery protection. It was an optional feature. Uh, we wanted other things. We wanted uh, a framework where when you get it, you have everything you need, in including your development environment. You did not have to look for packages and libraries and tools in other places and assemble them. Uh, and uh, there were other things that were important to us. Uh, since today, for example, we are the framework with support for the most databases. Since 2007, we were able to support uh, what Django calls projects. We call apps, but in, in their language, we were able to support multiple projects within the same uh, Web2Pi Web instance. And each project could have multiple database connections. And at the time, Django couldn't do that. And even today, I think you can have only one project. Um, there are other things where uh, that were very important for me, convention over configuration. So this is opposite to almost any other Python framework. Other Python frameworks um, give priority to explicit is better than implicit, which means you have to declare everything. 
and I did not really like that. I liked the Ruby on Rails better. Ruby on Rails, uh, there are conventions, and then if you don't like the defaults, you change things. And I think for ease of use, that's an important feature. So we went with convention of a configuration. It's more important than uh, explicit, explicit is better than implicit. And also backward compatibility. So we wrote in 2007, we did not break it. This does not mean we didn't change it. We changed a lot of stuff. We added a lot of new API, but we never broke an API that was available in 2007, with one exception that was a security issue. And very minor, nobody was using it. So what does it mean batteries included? It means that we wanted one zip package that you download, you click, and it starts. And inside you have the web server, not a toy web server, a multi-threaded SSL enabled web server, a database, in, we ship with SQLite, so a relational database, a database abstraction layer, something that writes SQL for me because the average person does not need to write SQL if you want to build a good uh, web application. And it's better if you don't write SQL because you can make all kinds of mistakes when you write it. So some, a tool should write SQL for you. Uh, we have a web-based ID, which basically means you can design your applications uh, you can edit them, you can maintain them, you can deploy them remotely, you can install them on your machine or other machines, all th done through the web ID that runs on the web server that is in the zip that you just installed. And uh, now for the power users, you don't have to use the web ID. You can even remove it completely from Web2Py and you can use the shell in the same way you use Django or you use uh, Ruby on Rails and you can use Emacs, that's what I use, I use Emacs. And in my demonstrations today, I will not use the web uh, ID, but having the web ID is really useful for new users. Um, we have a ticketing system, which means if you deploy your application, we don't make a distinction between uh, production mode and development mode, which is what almost every other framework does. They make this distinction. We don't believe that there is this distinction. I believe that I build an application and it's always going to be in the bug mode. And uh, my problem is that I deploy it, some random user on the other side of the earth is going to have a problem with my application, and uh, it, this user needs to be able to report it to me. Or even if the user doesn't report it to me, I need to be able to find out what happened. So every time there is an error in an application, the user is issued a ticket, the traceback, and the state of the application, all the variables is saved, and uh, I can see it. I have an interface where I can see who got the error, when, what was the traceback, what were the variables at the time. And uh, tickets are aggregated by traceback, so I can search by traceback. And, uh, and I can see uh, all the error messages, basically. So that's built in. Another thing which is built in is a job scheduler. So a typical thing in web applications is you have to do operations that take time. For example, sending emails. You don't want to click on a link or on a button on the screen and the computer freezes because it's sending an email. It takes time to send emails. So we have a built-in job scheduler. You can start as many web servers as you want. You can start as many uh, workers as you want. And when an HTTP request arrives that triggers an operation, it takes time. It gets queued, and then the, the, the workers pick it up, and we'll do it later. And this is distributed. Um, it's kind of like uh, Django Salary, but it's different because it, it, Django Salary is focused on uh, very efficient message communication between the workers and the servers. We're not concerned about that. We just use the database, which is already a shared uh, source of data, and we use the database for, uh, for communicating these tasks. Our assumption is that the task is computationally expensive. The time is not in communicating the task. The time is in executing the task. Um, we also ship with all kinds of other libraries. We ship with libraries that can parse and generate HTML, XML, JSON, RSS, ACS, PDF, RTF, XML, RPC, JSON, RPC, SOAP. We support all kinds of login methods. Here are least some, just some LDAP, PAM, Jovarain, Dropbox, Google, CAS, OpenID, Auth 1 and 2, X59 certificates. So this is built in. These are plugins that one can extend, but these are those that it ships with. We ships with uh, markup languages, markmin and markdown. Markmin was designed for Web2Py. It's very specific. It supports all kinds of things like the OEmbed protocol. Uh, we support payment systems, and when I say support, I support, it means it's built into Web2Py. It's already there. Uh, Google Wallet, Authorize.net, Stripe.com, and we should have Braintree support working on it. Okay, I promise to the Braintree people. Uh, we support Memcache and Redis, and uh, we come with Twitter Bootstrap. So the main point is all this stuff is in one box. You don't have to install anything. Uh, you don't have to configure anything. There is no configuration file. Okay, 
And uh, you just unzip it and click it. You can get the Windows version, the Mac version, or the, the source version. And either of them is fine. So what does it mean, convention over configuration? It means that this is the simplest program you can write. You just say uh, one URL, in this case, the URL um, app name slash default slash index maps into a function call into the folder app name, the controller called default, which is just a file, and the function called index. So if I write a function called index that returns hello world, uh, and then I, that URL, that gets automatically routed into uh, this function. The output of the function is a low word. The browser displays a low word. Now, uh, this is a convention. It doesn't mean I cannot change it. Exactly like in Django, you have uh, in Django you have something called routes.py. Oh, you, sorry, urls.py. We call it routes.py, and uh, we also have uh, regular expressions to do the routing. But you can remap the URLs any way you want. We do reverse mapping as well. Actually, we did reverse mapping before Django did. Um, the other point which was very important is, uh, so we have a model view uh, controller architecture. So to me, when you start building an application, you should always start from the models. So what is that your application stores? And this is the central point of Wetpy. So this is where Wetpy actually started. This is the first module. And uh, one thing that happened recently, Giovanni, who gave the talk yesterday, did a fantastic job in taking this particular part of Wetpy that was a single file in Wetpy, and it's always been an autonomous single file. Most of the components of Wetpy are single files that you can take out and you can use it without the rest of the framework. The templating language, the database abstraction layer, uh, the, the helper system, the form generation. Each component of Wetpy is one file, and since 2007, you could take this one file out of Wetpy and it would work with any Python project without Wetpy. But uh, this it us. People didn't know this. Okay, we, we, we people complained with our community saying you are closed, you do not collaborate with others. No, we are making all these files. We put in a folder which we call Web2Py. You can use any one of those files with any one of your projects, and you don't even have to say that you use Web2Py. What best can we do? But people didn't understand that. So Giovanni really helped us here, and what he did, he took this one file that over the years grew to be something like I don't know how many lines of code. How many lines of code was it? It was huge, right? Uh, so. Yes, so you went through this. It was so big that the some editors couldn't open it. Uh, so you went through the exercise to take this one file, turn it into its own project, which now is a name. It's called PyDAL. Um, and, uh, and now that it has its own name, and now people understand, I can use this piece of Wetpy without having the rest. And we got more contributors to improve it, and it's improving even more. Uh, OK, so you start from developing an application. You say, OK, I want to start a book. A book as a title, as authors, as a description, as cover image. Okay, this is what you want. So how do you say this in Web2Py? You just say this. I want to DB define a table. So DB is the thing that connects to my database. By the way, I can have as many databases as I want, as many connectors as I want, just a variable DB. Uh, I want to define a table that is called book, and as a field title, field authors, field description, field cover image. Now, you can be more detailed, so you can say, okay, the title requires that it's not empty. The authors is a list of strings. The description is text. The cover image is something that I upload. So another idea we to find is that uh, the syntax should be such that, um, yes, you need, to you need to know it to write it, but you should be able to read it without knowing too much. So it should be as close to English as possible. So this will define, this will not just define your table. Uh, if you try to access now this table that is created, uh, first of all, Wetpy already gives you an interface. So this code, this is complete program. This will give you an interface to uh, edit, uh, create records, edit records, delete them. Uh, with also going to the database and say, does this table exist? If not, create it. Uh, if you add the field here, it will say, okay, you added the field, so it will do an automatic database migration and alter the tables for you. So you never need to do things like alter table, for example. It will do it for you automatically. You, you change the state, the database is not in the same state, it will sync them. It will even migrate uh, field columns. Like if a column is in the wrong type, it will try to do a conversion if it's possible. Sometimes it's not possible. It will tell you it's not possible. Um, the other things you can do, for example, you can say auth signature. So I want every one of these records uh, signed by the person who created it. And I want to keep track of when it was created, when it was modified, who created, who modified it. Once this is done, then I can say the B book insert. I want to insert a book with a title Web2Py. So another thing which is important, we did not want an ORM like uh, Django. 
uh, an ORAM is a system in which a database table is mapped into a class in Python. And uh, this is like trying to square the circle, okay? It's really hard to do, you run it, been, it has been done, but uh, there are a lot of pitfalls in my opinion. We wanted something that maps into SQL queries. So we have commands like dot insert, dot update, dot delete, dot select. They map one to one to the corresponding SQL uh, select. And uh, so this is one of them. And uh, so we do not map uh, tables in the database into classes in the Python language. We instead map uh, records into Python dictionaries. That's what we do. And we generate the SQL through a syntax which is a pure Python syntax. So if I want to select stuff, I can say the B book title equal equal web to pi. So I compare the title with my constant string web to pi, uh, pass that to the DB, then select everything. Uh, only when you do dot insert, dot select, dot update, dot delete, only then there is a database communication and data is transferred. And then book is basically a list of records and uh, it's a list of dictionaries. And what if I make sure that whatever database you use, uh, the data comes back is always in the same format. So another thing that we wanted, we want the system to automatically generate forms. And uh, Django does that, but um, the, the way what Pi does it is way more sophisticated because it doesn't just generate the form, it also does a lot of form processing for you, and the form is different depending on what kind of context. Um, and also, it's modular in the sense that the form is made of widgets. For every uh, field in your database, you can specify which widget is supposed to render that particular field. It's not just a question of validation. Like, if you want to generate error messages in the form because it's invalid, uh, what I will do all of that for you. You can change it, but we will do all of that processing for you. So I say SQL form DB book, which means give me a form generated from the SQL of the book and process it. Process it means uh, if the form is submitted, do all the validation. If uh, the, the form is invalid, the report error messages to the user and, uh, and all kinds of other things that you may need to do. There may be fields that are computed, compute those fields depending on the fields you have and so on. So create form is now a variable that I can just embed in a web page and it gives me all the logic required um, to, to run it. And again, each of these is almost a complete program at this point. And I think I can say, I can say, okay, I want SQL form, which is an edit form for record number one. So if I specify which record, it will give me an edit form for that record. Uh, sometimes I want more. I can say, okay, I don't want just one form. I want a complete grid of books. I want to be able to have pagination, create forms, edit forms, delete forms. That's a great thing. That's another high level widget that will create a whole interface to interact with, uh, with my book table. Now, even if I don't write that line, I have an interface to interact with my database, but it's an administrative interface. It's an interface for uh, the administrators of the system. That gives me an object can embed in my web pages that provides a grid, which is now an interface to the users of my application. And I can specify all kinds of parameters to set permissions, like this group of people can edit, uh, people can only edit the, the, the records they created, you know, I can set all kinds of policies. Only uh, this group of people can download these images and so on. You can set policies in, in when you make a grid. And I think we added very, very recently is that one line. So uh, literally, I have any program in Web2Py, I add that one line, auth.enable record versioning the DB, I have full auditing for all my tables. It's gonna remember every change I ever make to every table without breaking any database reference. Um, portability, so this is another very important thing. So DB, as I said, is a variable. I can have as many database connections as I want for each one of the applications that runs under uh, the Web2Py instance. So I can have one Web2Py instance, and actually I do. I have one Web2Py instance where I run like 200 applications, okay, just one. Because nobody, I uh, don't get users for all the 200 applications at the same time. So I have 200 applications running under the same instance. Each one of them has its own one or more database connections. So for example, we heard yesterday from Luca. Luca uses two database connections in one application because he connects to the Google data store and the SQL storage. Um, so you basically define that yourself. You say, you have a default, but you can change it. You can say, I want it to be a database abstraction layer connection to my SQLite database. Okay, then, then you decide that you know, this is not a good choice. You want Postgres. Okay, you change that one line, the rest of the code will work. Uh, you want to connect to the Google Data Store, you connect to the Google Data Store. MongoDB, you connect to MongoDB. And the rest of the program doesn't change, nothing changes. Um, so, sorry. 
So let's go back to this controller. So we have this model view controller design. Uh, let's go back to this one. Instead of returning a string, I can return a dictionary. If I return a dictionary, uh, what if I will render the things in the dictionary into a uh, default page? And then you can customize that default page. Uh, so here, we can decorate those functions. So we can set requirements, like uh, auth requires login, or I want a list of books. Uh, now, before we, you know, we go too far here, let's just build something, OK? OK, so you download way to pi you unzip it, you go under it, you start it, OK? If you have the Windows version, you just click. Then you open it, OK? It says, welcome, I'm here. Um, if you want here, you can, there should be a button somewhere, you can do admin. This is the administrative interface. It's an app itself. You can remove it. Actually, I want to remove this one, right? Because we're going to rebuild it. Let me install this app. The app is uninstalled. So this is the, the interface. I can go and look at any app, and I can edit the app, and I can edit the files. I can do everything I want through the web interface. I can look what errors occurred in this app, and I can do uh, uh, versioning with Mercurial is built in and other stuff like that. Anyway, um, oh, um, let me do this. I'm sorry. I, need to, I have a process that was not supposed to be running. Matching. Okay, I think I killed it. Okay, so we'll just redo it. It's fine. I type fast, right? Okay, so we go under the folder applications. I, I could do this through uh, through the web interface, but I decide to type. So I say, make me a folder called cats. We're going to build an application to store pictures of cats. What else could we do, right? And then we allow users, they have to be logged, they have to uh, register, log in to post a picture of a cat. And people will be able to uh, rate the picture of the cats. And the system is going to compute an average rating for the pictures. And uh, it will display them all. Okay? So this is what we're going to build. Uh, so I uh, copy the welcome app into cats, which is exactly what happens when you click the button in the web interface. And then I say, go into this folder. You know th what this is too? Okay. Go into that folder. And uh, uh, what if I comes with a scaffolding app that you see it gives me a menu here, OK? I say, remove that menu. Uh, it comes with a default controller, like as a default index. Just remove that one. Uh, it comes with default views. And I say, I don't want those ones. Remove those ones. So now it's a kind of blank application, OK? Let's try from scratch. Make me a menu. The menu should say that the logo says cats. And it's that class. And if I click, it goes back to index. Uh, and I don't want a menu, OK? So I'm done with this. So uh, let's say this is a default uh, a controller. Let's have an index that says a low word of cats, OK? So let's open this page, a low word of cats. Let's go on and say, OK, let's define a variable called message, which is a low word of cats, return locals, uh, and edit the, the index HTML. So this is my index page. I put message there. And I can embed any kind of object, like embed a message. And uh, let's look what I made. So now it's a HTML page that says lower the cats in H1. OK, we got it so far. Let's create a database model. OK, I want to define a table cat, which has a field name, which I require is not empty, and there's an image. So people will come here, will type the name of a cat, will type uh, the URL of the image of a cat, and uh, I'm going to sign all of those. I just want to make sure that I know who posted the picture of this cat, just in case they post something which is not a picture of a cat. Or perhaps they misunderstood the word cat. Um, so here we go. And uh, actually, I make a change to it. Oh, make too many changes here. Wait. So here we go. So I'm adding the, the index controller. So what I'm doing here is the following. I'm saying uh, the index, I define three variables. One is called login. It's a helper A. So with my helper, the same name as the HTML elements. So I want an A helper. So I want basically an A link that says login to post. And it's an href, which is the URL to the user login page, and, uh, and a class, which is button primary. So uh, I define this button. And I define a form that says, this is a form to create a cat 
process this form. Only do this if the user is logged in. Otherwise, give me a login button. So basically, I want a form on the page or a login button if the user is not logged in. And also, I want a selection of all my cats. So db cat select, give me all the cats. Return locals, give me all the local variables. And this one line basically say, I want to expose in this application an application level uh, system for uh, login, registration, logout, and all that stuff. So this will expose all those pages uh, it's built in. OK, done with this. Uh, let's have an in let's add this index page. I want to extend the default layout. I want to have a div. I want to put the form in the div. And then I want, for every cut that I have, I want another div. And I want the image, the cut image in there. And, uh, and I'm done. OK, so let's see what we got so far. OK, cats. Here, this is my application. I just made this. So login to post. Well, I don't have an account. Sign up. OK, let's do that. Oh, no, what did I just do? OK. Start typing standing. OK. OK, so now I can upload the image of a cat. What's the name of a cat? My cat. I don't, I don't have a cat. So. Uh, so let's find our cat image. Uh, here we go. I don't know. Uh, view image. So we got this one. Um, let's see if this works. Uh, no, that's not what I do. Okay, let's try again. Well, it's okay, well it works. So I got the image of the cat. I can post with other pictures, they will show up on the screen. OK, so we got this part done. So well, I want more cats. So let's edit uh, just some random file in the system I put into this private folder, random cats. And I import the URL lib. So I'm going to download images of cats and put them in my database. So for key range 30, I want 30 random cats. And believe it or not, there is an API to get pictures of cats. OK, so somebody wrote it. Actually, there are multiple people who wrote APIs to get uh, random images of cats. And uh, so I'm going to say that I want from this API called the cat API, I want, I want uh, uh, the source of these images in GIF format. I want 30 of them. And uh, um, I want to get the URL. The thing is this is redirecting me to the URL of the picture of the cat. And into the database table cat, I want to insert a cat called cat number whatever k. And that's the image of the cat. Commit it. Now, th this, is a way to, this is a Python program. This is no longer a uh, way to Py application, uh, even if I want to use the WebPy API. So there are different ways to use the WebPy API, like uh, the big cat insert. I can import it, or I can just run this program into an environment. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm done. Uh, so now I go exit from this folder, and I tell WebPy to run the application, to run this file I just wrote uh, into the application cats. So in the same environment as a controller, I want to import all the modules and make it available to that, to that Python program. So this is going, it's doing something now. It's getting the picture of the cats. Hopefully, it's connecting properly, looks like. Shouldn't take too long. It was faster yesterday. 30 pictures, shouldn't be too bad. Let's give it a few more minutes. I, it's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm embarrassed. Should be much faster than this. I know it's doing something. <laughs> OK, let's see what's doing. Well, done, done. OK, it's done. And uh, it's very slow for some reason. OK, it's done. So what did we just do? Oh, we got picture of cats. OK. They're all JPEGs. OK, so this part works. OK, so now we go back to where we were in the folder of the cat application. Let's edit the menu again. Now, I need something else. So people are going to upload things which are not picture cats. So I need to remove them. So uh, I want to say that um, I want to check if the user is membership of the group administrators. This doesn't exist. This is not a web to buy thing. I'm just going to make a group administrators. We have uh, role-based access control. I can make groups and membership. So if I am a member of this group, uh, add the menu item that says uh, manage. And if I click, it goes to a URL of a page called manage. This page does not exist. So let me make that page. 
and uh, uh, I'm going to make a page called Manage that requires membership in the administrator group. If I have, uh, I want a grid for a cat, and I want this uh, the image to be represented by an image helper where the source is the value of this image. So I basically want this table to show the images of cats. Return locals. This is done. OK, so now I, try, I go back to this page. I mean, I don't see this manage thing. Why don't I see it? Well, let's go into an administrative interface. I did not make a group called administrator. Did I spell it right? I did. Uh, so I made the group. So now I give membership to uh, myself, to this group. Oh, no, I was already a member of that group. Administrator, right here. So if I go back to my cat application, I have the Manage button. So I click the Manage button. I have an interface to manage my cats. I can edit them. I can add records. Uh, I, can, I can search records. I can do all kind of stuff here. OK, so this is done. Now this is part of my application. I have this management interface. Uh, OK, so I have not created a view. It worked anyway. I can create a view because I want to personalize it. I want to say manage cats at the top. OK, fine. Um, so uh, I can do this again. And, uh, and now it says manage cats. So I can edit it any way I want. It's just another page. So let me now edit this table. And I want to add ratings for these cats. So I want to say that uh, a record cat has a rating field, which is a float. It's not writable. It's not readable. So it's not going to appear in the form. People, when they submit a cat, they don't see this field. And I'm going to have another table where I register a vote for a cat. So this reference is a cat uh, with a rating So and, and this signed. So this means this is my own uh, rating for this particular cat. It's signed. It means this references the person who created it is going to remember who created this record. That's the person who rated the cat. And a cat can be rated by multiple people. This is an example one too many. OK, this is done. Uh, and uh, before I go to default, let me go back to the administrative interface I had before. And let me go to actually the design page. Let me show this QR log. And let me show that uh, alter table was executed. You know, I didn't have to do anything. What to I find out? I changed my table. I needed to alter table. It altered the table. It created the table vote. So I have a log of everything up to the database. Uh, and again, I can manage it. I, I see the other table here. I see the references and everything. OK, let's keep going. Um, so now I need to be able to manage this. And uh, so I, I change one line. I say, when, when you show me the cats, sort them in reverse order of the cat rating. OK, it's very important. And uh, oh, th this is nothing. This is the leftover in my presentation. OK, now let's add something. Uh, below the image, I want to show the cat name. And if the user is logged in, I want an input um, that says that the value of the input is the cat rating. This input does not need to have a name, just needs to know the cat rating. And also it's a data cat, which is the cat ID. So basically, this is an input that knows which cat it's about. And the value is the cat rating. Uh, now I write a little bit of JavaScript. And you don't need to understand the JavaScript. But basically, the JavaScript says, take that input, replace it with as many stars as the value the input contains. OK? Uh, so modify the DOM and replace the input with stars. So this does n% percent pound x2605 uh, are stars in Unicode. And then you say, if you click on a star, make a post request to a URL vote, which I've not created yet, tell me which input field I clicked on. So which star? What cat is this about? What's the rating I clicked on? OK, that's, that's done with, the, with JavaScript. It's all the JavaScript you need. Let's reopen this. OK, now I have stars. OK, so now this is my rating. It's not doing anything. It's doing HTTP post request to the server with star, telling the server a user clicked on the star with that uh, number. Uh, so, OK, what do I do next? Uh, well, I need this vote action. I need to deal with the HTTP AJAX request that goes on in background. OK, so fetch the cat this is about. Give me, give me the cat ID that the user once clicked on. Uh, and, uh, and 
get the record for created by me, so out user ID is me, created by me about this cat, and, uh, and uh, if, I, if there is such a record, update the record. Uh, otherwise, insert the record and store the writing in there. Now, I need to, this is important, I need to update the record of the cat. So there is my rating for this cat. There are other people rating for this cat. I need to average and update the rating of the cat based on the average of all the other users who have voted for this cat. So WebCopy could do aggregates since 2007. Django didn't do it for another two or three years and still doesn't do it the way WebCopy does it. WebCopy does it very generally. You can do aggregates for almost any SQL query you can think of. Okay, so you define a variable, in this case just a shortcut, for DB vote rating average. So I want a DB vote rating average. And I say, from the vote table with the cat with this cat ID, select the average. So this is going to return a table with just one number, which is the average. Give me the first record. Now, give me the cat with this cat ID. Update the, right, the rating to be the average. OK, done. Um, let's open this again. Well, now it works. Now if I click this and I reload the page, it remembers it because now it's storing my rating, it's averaging with other users, and it remembers it. Um, okay, what else, how can we make this better? Um, well, let's just create a very simple API to get all the cats in my system. So I make an API, uh, just a new control uh, function called cats. It selects a cat select, so give me all the cats, give them to me as list. Uh, so uh, call this, so open the same uh, cats application, default controller, cats function, but dot JSON. I want it in JSON. Oh, it doesn't work? Why doesn't it work? Let me spell it. Page not available. What did I just do? Okay, let's check what I did. Um, okay. Oops. I don't know where I am. I'm in the wrong page. Um, okay, this happens, right? And uh, it should be fine. Um, oh, this is what happened. I don't know what happened. I know what I did. This mistake. Okay. Okay, I get it in JSON. I forgot to specify the name of the object I wanted to return. I it, I can specify any object. I don't want it in JSON. I want it in XML. Uh, and, and I can get other types. So depending on the data structure I return, uh, I could get an RSS feed. I could get a uh, um, Google Maps. I could get. Uh, uh, mail. It, it just I have to return the proper data structure to be converted into the target. I can get a PDF file. So it, it, if if you get a data structure that can be converted in the, the target that you want, it will convert for the target that you want. Okay. So this is one thing. What else can we do with this? Well, um, let's create some tasks. So I want to use the scheduler to tell my system to periodically count how many cats I have in my system. So I import the scheduler, I make an instance of the scheduler, and I just create a function that says count cats, and the function uh, returns the db cat count. Okay, that's, that's all it does. So what do I get at this point? Well, I got a bunch of new tables. I got tables that say uh, db scheduler task, db scheduler run, db scheduler worker, and, uh, and I'm not sure what that is. Um, so basically, now I have defined a function in my program. Any function in the program can be called as a task, and I can register this as a task. Every time the task runs, it's going to have a run. So one task can run multiple times. So let's do that. Um, let me create a new record in this. Actually, there is a whole interface to do this better. I'm just not using it. I'm just using the low-level stuff. 
So count cats. Um, and I want to run this function called count. So this is the name I want to give to the task. So this is the name of the function. I chose them to be the same. What arguments I want to call the function with, uh, don't care. Uh, what, how many times I want to repeat it? I want to repeat it forever. I want to call it every 10 seconds. And uh, OK, done. Now it's queued. So the record was inserted. So I can look here. I have a record inserted. So now I can uh, run a worker. I can run as many workers as I want. They will pick up the task and process it. So I want to run a worker for this particular task. So it's running. Um, so well, let me run this. Let me, let me click on this record. And let's see what's happening. Let's see the runs for this record. And well, eventually it should run. I messed up things a little bit before, so I may not run. Um, but eventually, I'm going to see every 10 seconds, I can see one record in which this task, oh, it did run. OK, it ran, it completed. This is when it started, when it ended. And I can click on this record, and I can see that the system is counting 31 cats, and every 10 seconds is going to run it and, and do it. OK, how much time do I have? OK, so. Uh, that's not much, so I'm going to go very quickly to the slides. Um, OK, so that's basically you build web to buy applications. That, that's what we build it for. So uh, this is would be a, an example of a program. Uh, you can have different decorators for access control. Every application has built-in federated authentication. Every application, including the one I built, is a provider for central authentication service. Um, you can manage memberships and groups. You can delegate the authentication to other applications. We have the task scheduler. Uh, this is something I didn't talk about. You can actually embed one page into another page, and it automatically makes it a Jaxi. Let's put it that way. It does it automatically. So that's how you do it. You create well, like two controller functions, and you can say the first one should embed the second. So you create a view for the first one, and you say load the second via Ajax. So you're going to get the complete content of the other thing embedded. If it is a form, you submit. It only refreshes that box. It does not refresh the whole page. This is something I didn't talk about. Every web application has a built-in uh, wiki. I call it a wiki, but it's really it's a full-fledged content management system with permissions. So uh, you, can, you, you can add that one line to your application, and now you have pages that you can edit. You can give permissions. You can say who else can edit that. And, and uh, they, they convert uh, your markup to HTML. and um, they can even store code, so you can give permission to these people to embed code into your pages and so on. Um, so you, you can do all kinds of stuff, like specify if the wiki is Mark Min or is pure HTML, should they have permissions, uh, should different users create pages with different prefixes, depending on the group they belong in. Um, uh, we have a system to create RESTful APIs. Uh, actually, we have three systems. We have the old one, we have the new one, and we have one that supports the collection JSON protocol. This is a standard for hypermedia API. Basically, the APIs are created automatically from your database. So like here, I say, uh, take my database. For the table book, I want to expose get, post, put, and delete. No restriction to anybody. It will create self-documented JSON API for, for that table. You can list more tables. We'll make it for the other tables. You can set permissions. You can do a post. You can do a get, and so on. Uh, this is all documented because it's a uh, it's standard. I mean, it's not something we invented. Uh, we support other things like payment system. Here I mentioned Stripe, but definitely we want to have uh, brain tree support. So conclusions: uh, it's been around for eight years, and my users have done an excellent job. They rewrote more than seventy percent of what I wrote in two thousand seven, and they had a lot, a lot of stuff. So uh, I'm. I think we are very mature at this point. We, we keep adding little things, and it's getting really hard sometimes to explain because we get into such little level of details about the changes that it's really hard to explain what the changes are about. Um, but if you had the code written in 2007, it still runs. Uh, but certain things have changed. We moved from Python 2 to Python 3. So we promise backward compatibility. How do we handle that? Okay. So we are going to port Python uh, Web to Py to Python 3. The database abstraction layer has already been porting experimentally. That was the hard part. Everything else is relatively easy. So we will have a version running in Python 3. Uh, th the issue is that we find, like in this program today, JavaScript programming is more and more important. Web2Py is kind of JavaScript as agnostic. But uh, we find that to be more and more important today. OK, thank you. Questions? Yes. So, thank you for the talk. And uh, Web2Py is incredibly rich in the features that it provides.
advice to the user? With the eight years, how do you make uh, choices for the features that you will put into the framework, and uh, so that it's not a unmaintainable bloatware? Yes. So uh, that, that's a very good point. Uh, we we have a very simple rule usually, and the the rule is this. Um, if you suggest any change in the code that makes the code shorter but keeps the functionality, we take it. Um, if you suggest any change in the code that makes the code faster, we take it. If you suggest any change that adds a feature, as long as it does not break anything, we probably take it. Uh, what we do is we organize things in a certain way. So we have core libraries and uh, uh, so usually there it's a question of you know adding one option to a function. Rarely we add functions there. Uh, but we have the contrib folder where we may add uh, like new login methods, new payment systems, or, or uh, you know a new library for generating, I don't know, RTF documents, whatever. Uh, and uh, so we, we have a modular structure. Uh, we did not really run into um, problems of uh, bloatware. I mean, it uh, really has been pretty lean since the beginning. So, as a framework designer, what were your go-to references uh, that helped you build it in such a modular way and maintain it? Uh, I can say definitely the framework I learned the most was Django, Django and Ruby on Rails. Th these are the two uh, I learned the most, and I really loved Django. I was a uh, Django user before making Web Five. I just found it was too hard and too many limitations. Things I wanted to do in terms of I had to specify too many, too much stuff. Uh, so, for for the model view controller design, I think that's the framework I took the most inspiration from. Uh, from the actual uh, architecture of helpers and controllers, probably it was uh, Ruby on Rails. I, I think it's closer to that. For for other things like uh, the way we uh, we handle escaping uh, in um, in uh, in the HTML, uh, I took uh, the a command called XML. Uh, I mean, I implemented it, but it was the same command from the kid. Uh, a template language used by Turbo Gears at the time. Uh, for for the objects for the HTTP request and response, uh, I really like the syntax of the web.py framework. Uh, so basically, it has the same syntax as those. Uh, we did not take any code from anybody uh, at that point. Uh, well I think we still uh, didn't take any. We, we had a couple of modules in Contrib where we may have taken something from somebody, which is probably a knowledge and con they've been contacted in all the cases. But everything has been rewritten from scratch, basically. have the opportunity to ask more questions during the break, so we're going to get ready for the next speak. Okay. Thank you, Massimo. One Thank more you. Round of applause, please.